on this computer. And, uh, welcome, everybody. We are already busy with the conversation before we start. So we talk about uh, the miserable I, things happening around COVID. Uh, and uh, what were you going to say, uh, Susanna? Yeah, I was just saying that, uh, it, it, you know, re regardless of, of what position you are in, but even going through the process of the disease itself and being in an ICU, people are still denying uh, yeah. the disease, but, which what? makes no sense at that point when your life is in danger and you're dying, you know. Um, so. Yeah, it was a calculation that now at this moment, uh, one in every three families has somebody in their family who died from COVID. Yeah. Right, so that is a huge amount. Now, that, that is, there's no country bigger than that. Uh, I mean, UK have a lot of people dying from uh, from COVID, Italy, and all the kind of countries, and they come nowhere near uh, the United States, of course. Percentage-wise, they don't they don't differ very much. All countries, depending a little bit on how fast they were in implementing things, um, and how that actually how, where the difference actually come from. But you can. You can really see now we have this peak of 5 million people died already. So that is really like a huge amount. And uh, if, if you look at these kind of stories, like one third, no, one in every three families have somebody in their family who died in some countries. Um, and people are willing to believe all kinds of things. When you compare with the few, relatively few people who died uh, as a result of vaccination. I, I mean, I happen to know a few people with adverse side effects. And I do believe that the vaccine is not like a holy solution or anything like that. Um, I don't trust uh, chemical companies very much, med medical medicine makers. I don't use to trust them very much, but that is also ingrained in Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine says like anything you can do without medicine is always better, right? So if you can do it yourself is better. If you have to ask a therapist, it's a little bit less good. And if you have to ask somebody to make you something, yeah, like a herbal medicine or something like this, or a chemical medicine, that is that is the worst. So the chance that you will survive your disease becomes smaller and smaller with every successive step, right? Um, and we are, of course, also ourselves, we are in the health building business, which is uh, considered uh, fake news by many people, right? Uh, you have the organizations for uh, quack medicine and stuff like this. Well, we know that we really try to work from uh, from uh, as much integrity as possible, and uh, you have to stay on tune of all these kind of things happening. And from the conversation that I had with several of you in the last few weeks, I came to understand that I also have to sell the Health Builder program more or less as the alternative for the alternative. <laughs> so that's very interesting, and how we're going to package that uh, that that part of the message. But <clears throat> what is interesting is that. Uh, for um, how do you say uh, for the whole program um, emphasizing uh, these kind of things these kind of differences and problems is very important I don't know if anybody of you saw the post from last Sunday and the week Sunday before or two Sundays before about um, uh, uh, True knowledge and uh, factoids, and about uh, Eastern and Western views of the Tao of uh, of of, uh, of uh, wilderness. Have you seen it? No. Oh, okay, but it's very interesting because it touches also on the same same subject. Subject, in a sense, like when when is something truthful? And I take a little bit of a different stance in the in the video because I'm very well aware of the fact that there's people who think that what anybody who's doing an alternative medicine is, uh, is fake news. There's people within alternative medicine who are fighting with each other, what is fake news, and so forth and so forth. You see there's now this dominance of uh, Chinese medicine as organized by the Chinese government, which is in itself fake news because of uh, the way how they break with the past. So it's not really Chinese, it's uh, Western medicine with Chinese characteristics. Um, and that is not the same, right? Um, and you see that people are interested in Chinese medicine, but they don't know much about it. So they can study Chinese medicine, eventually get drawn into this westernization. So you see that it has become a loop. And in countries like the Netherlands, and the United States probably the same, during the whole COVID pandemic, you see that people don't really ask for alternatives, for a solution. Everybody gets frightened. And they 
they lock themselves up in their home or they um, or they fall back to uh, regular medicine uh, solutions in case anything help happens. Of course, a minority of people, they do try to find solutions through alternative medicine, but it's a really tiny minority. And um, even in China itself, even though there's a large, you know, media attention uh, bought by the Chinese medicine universities and stuff like this to pay attention to, uh, to uh, Chinese medicine solutions for it, and although they were active in Wuhan and stuff like this, doing research, um, the active the active participation of Chinese medicine in the whole COVID problem still is relatively low because the government itself doesn't have that much uh, trust in uh, Chinese medicine, uh, not so much because it couldn't work, but because they don't understand the, 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 the group of people, what they're talking about uh, very much. So that is a very clear... One of the reasons why in the Help Builder program, I emphasized that there is no uh, theoretical uh, foundation required for the classes, is that people can talk from, about these kind of things from their own perspective. So what we're going to do today as a practice um, is going to talk about uh, how would you define uh, your practice so far? How would you explain it to other people if you would use your own words and not so much try to be uh, taking Chinese medicine or Kung Fu talking points, but how you would do for yourself. Um, in that sense, uh, I have to first ask you though one other question. How are you progressing with your Udang fitness exercises and uh, uh, classes and with the uh, food medicine module? How far are you getting? Are you making progress? If you make progress, say yes. Just say yes. Okay, okay. Okay, if you have make no progress, say no. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Okay, that is enough. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, believe, believe me, if it is up to me, it is never enough. So don't worry about it. Uh, I will always complain that all the students are too lazy. My teachers always complain that I was too lazy and that all my generational students were too lazy. And it is always going to be like that. So teachers always complain about students being too lazy. And you can only see the true results after a few years' time. So now the only thing we have to get to get you to is towards your certification, right? So the certification has to come eventually. And so this is the step-by-step -step process. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, what do I say? Oh, yeah. Uh, so then we go towards trying to put things into your own words. How would you, how would you put into your own words uh, the program? And you can talk about your benefits. You can talk about your, uh, your ideas. How would you translate it from your own background and so on and so forth. So it doesn't matter what you say. You get three minutes. You want to think about it first or you already know what you want to say? You may take a little bit more than three minutes, but I'm counting on three minutes per person. Well, yeah. What, what, is, what is your question exactly? Which program? About the the program that you are right now in the the fitness program uh, instructor instructor course program and the and the food medicine program. Those are two different things. You can talk about both of them, no problem, because you you all came into the program with these two, right? This is the health building program. It's not the bachelor program. So it's just a uh, help them, just uh, instruct the course things. So who would like to go first? Anna, you want to go first? You're laughing. You already have your story ready. I, I got no story, but I'll give it a go. Um, well, basically, um, what I said well, from the beginning that we started the Wudang, uh, the, the health building program on Wudang Fitness is um, first I had helped me into getting into really good habits, a daily habits of, of practicing and moving, which over many years I would always start and, and, and not keep it up. So that, that, that for me is a very good talking point of, of explaining that it's, um, it's something that really, it, it's, uh, it's, it benefits you because in society now everyone is sitting too much. So we have less movement in our daily, daily routine. And it's uh, something that there's no pressure that you can, 
perform at any time, at your own pace, in your own time, uh, even if it's a couple of techniques, uh, using training your body to, uh, to use your whole body and shift in and fine tune in your body in a way that um, a lot of other things don't target. They target like larger, um, the larger system where this does a fine tuning on, on the holistic system of the body. Um, and it's a combination of teaching you of, of, of connecting again with your breath as well as with the movements and, um, and, and just getting your body moving in any sense, which, which movement brings health because if you don't move, I think that's what brings disease and illness is lack of movement and lack of, uh, uh, of proper breath and, and diet, like we said. Right. And uh, yeah, that's it basically. And it's the philosophy of, of basically just supporting and, and trying to understand your own limits and trying to grow from them slowly, slowly at your own pace and not being too hard on yourself. That's very good, actually. One and a half minutes. So it's very fast. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't really make any sense. No, no, it's great. Great. Who wants to go next? But does anybody want to make a remark first about what she says? I also, for me, it's new to do regular exercise every day. It's very nice, but I still want to think a bit more. Okay. Anybody can else? I just want to add you? one thing. Sorry, you can oh, I just yeah. add one thing. Um, when you get into the habit of doing something, because we all have good and bad habits in life. So we can all either lose them or build them. Um, when you don't do it, you start to miss it. Your body starts to ask for it. So, that's and that's in, that's in bad habits as well as good habits. So I try to focus that you can, you can create good habits in your lifestyle. That's, that's definitely also true. Uh, once you start getting good habits, uh, eventually you get averse from the bad habits. That's true. Yeah. Uh, in the same way, like if you have bad habits, you get averse from good habits. It works in the same way. Works in the same way. There's no avoiding of good or bad habits once you're in that direction. That's why I always in classes I talk about trends. Now you're not having good habits, but you have a trend towards good habits. You have a trend towards bad habits, and it's a matter of uh, diluting the one trend and strengthening the other trend. And so it's very difficult to make like a final decision. You say like now I'm going to really start it, but once you start gradually you start building up better habits. And as a result of that, your better habits become gradually more clear. And you also start noticing changes in your body and you start noticing uh, improvements in your health in general. And that's why we always talk also always about miles, miles practice, right? Not, not overdo it because this overdoing also creates uh, antipathy, you create aversion because it is uh, also giving you uh, acidification or pains or something else, yes? We have to in the day indeed know what is your limits. That's true. Who wants to go next? Anybody? I, well, I'd just like to make a, a point from my own personal sort of thing that, that progress isn't a straight line for, you know, and, and also because um, I mean, at the moment, I'm sort of like suffering with the sort of knees and hip up until then, I felt that things were going quite well and I was noticing sort of benefits and then suddenly something comes along and then you've got to work through that. So it's not a sort of straight line thing. And also um, when you're doing more than one program as well, it's hard to know whether it's the breath yoga or it's, it's, it's or, the, or the bamboo formula qigong or whether it's the uh, wudang fitness where the benefits are coming up or whether it's it's, it's a, a combination of them if you're just doing one then you could say but you know so it's hard really for me to, for instance to say this benefit has come from because they all seem to work together um and as i say it's it's not a, for me it's not a straight line progress it's you know, a trend, but it's sort of like um, at points there's, especially when you get older, you know, things come along and you have to sort of work through them and you, you feel like you're being set back for a while. And for instance, certain things I haven't felt like doing because the knees and the hip have just been, so then it, yeah. So I just, 
So it's not so straightforward. It's quite difficult, really, just to sort of pinpoint uh, benefits from one specific practice if you're doing more than one. <laughs> so, just. Um, anybody wants to say something about that? Yeah, Susanna? Well, it, interestingly uh, enough, I, I had a conversation yesterday. Uh, was it Sunday, maybe? Yeah, Sunday, with somebody, uh, or Saturday, somebody uh, who was expressing some interest in the Wudan fitness. And that was one of the points I also stressed um, because um, she had surgery uh, not too long ago on her shoulders. And, and maybe this is a question I want to bring up too. Um, I, I was actually looking to see whether I could put together just a small group of a pilot group uh, to, to start. And I was looking for people who were kind of, let's say more or less healthy uh, or they tend to do some physical uh, exercise or they're in more or less good shape with aches and pains here and there, like we may all have every now and then. But I haven't thought of her being the coordinator and the point of contact. She just was going to help me, and, but she just seemed, was the person who had the surgery, uh, first person. Um, and I was trying to tell her that the program, you know, it's something that it's not something that she needed to follow me strictly and do exactly what I had to do, which is which tends to be something that we all do when they go to the gym or even when, when they go to a physical therapist, uh, you know, that, that they're doing, they're trying to do what they're told to do um, rather than doing what their awareness uh, of their body and mind is, you know, of course you, you're following the form of, of the instructor, but you are also trying to understand uh, where your blocks are and your pains are. And she was a little bit afraid um, that maybe she couldn't do some of the exercises. And I said, well, um, she has seen them. Uh, I did a demonstration with a group of um, special needs. Um, I don't know whether I told you this or not, but um, yeah. about a week ago or two weeks ago, um, just a demo and she was the coordinator of a group. Um, and she did see some of the exercises, but there were some with the shoulders and she was worried about those. So I was telling her that, you know, the fact that we all wake up every day with different feelings in our body, our mind, maybe in one place or another, we need to learn to, to understand where we are in that day and proceed with what we think it's doable and acceptable for uh, to harmonize with the exercise and not overdo it. And that's where we try to learn um, where is the line to cross or not to cross, to do, overdo, or stay in the balance in the balancing point. Um, so this is what I try to explain. And along those lines as well, I say this just it's not a straight line. Some days you may fall down and in that area and say, I can't do more or I cannot do it at all. Yeah. And it's okay, you know. And maybe another day you can do it, do it better. But the trend uh, is to pro is in a progression upwards, hopefully, you know, to a healing or to something better. What it is a little bit with our society is we are, as Europeans, uh, we are primarily a militaristic society. We complain about countries like China that are militaristic, but we have a militaristic religion. Christianity is very militaristic. If you look at the angels and uh, the way how everything is being organized, if you look at our education, everything is very linear and you know everything goes in uh, cohorts and stuff like this. And it is very difficult for people to imagine uh, freedom. Now we all the time talk about freedom of speech and stuff like this, but freedom we don't really talk about. And I think this is one of the main issues what you both point out in, uh, in exercise because what we try to find is freedom, freedom of suffering basically, right? Uh, this is important in Buddhism, it's important in Christianity, it's important in Taoism, it's important in Hinduism, it's in every religion, Islam also, it is, every time it is very important. And at the moment when you, when you 
when you go through this, uh, this, this process of trying to resolve your suffering and finding freedom, it means that you find freedoms to do new things. You know, you open up yourself and you rejuvenate a little bit, you become a little bit more young. And what Chris uh, points out is that <clears throat> the progression that you make is indeed gradual. So it means that, you know, you, you go up and down and you go left and right. And so you go in all kinds of directions. And like what you also point out, Susanna, is that indeed every day you wake up and you have to figure out where you are at that moment, yeah, right? Um, we have this idea of the self as a permanent something that is Platonistic uh, thought. And I always have to laugh a little bit about Platonism because it influenced things like Buddhism and Christianity and all the other things. Because the thought is that this world is basically illusionary. It's not really real, but there is a real world behind it. And this real world behind it, everything is perfect, right? And we only have to get eventually to that real world. So we have to transcend ourselves to get back to that world. And then in this, um, this idea about that this self is actually this platonic reality inside ourselves, right? Uh, this is where the idea of the soul comes from. The soul, the self, the I, this is all the same. Right, and in Christianity it's explained like this, and Buddhism is explained like that, and all these kind of different philosophies explain a little bit different. But in reality, every day we are shaping our sense of self through how we are experiencing ourselves, how we communicate with other people, and so on. And I don't know if in this group I ever used the idea of the starfish as a model for humanity. Did I ever use it? Yes, I think so. Yes, I guess. And maybe at the beginning, uh, when I start explaining my idea about humanity, I definitely used it in the bachelor program. That's for sure. But what I what I say, like, okay, starfish and people, they are basically the same. Now we have five legs. Uh, this is uh, two, three, uh, and two below. That is uh, five, right? Uh, our sexual organs originally were higher, so we don't call them as legs. And, and <laughs> they have gradually evolutionary sunk a little bit downward. Uh, because it was more convenient, uh, maybe easier to protect uh, when we are standing straight up. Um, but uh, what happens is that uh, <clears throat> at the moment when we are starfish, you crawl and you're in a crowd, you know, everything is pretty much two dimensional. And you have this uh, story about flatland, right? About two dimensional people. Everybody knows this uh, story more or less. And this is uh, how would creatures behave in a two dimensional world. And starfish live in a two-dimensional world, basically. And they can go up and down a little bit, but not that much. And that means that when we are all starfish, to be able to transcend ourselves from this flatness, yeah, we had to go up and we had to go over other starfish. And if we could stand upright, right, uh, then we could see a little bit more of things. So we basically, we started building this bone structure, muscle structure in our, in our body. We started differentiating further and further. And as starfish are, uh, all the different kind of uh, animals that are walking around the world, they're all basically adaptations from the starfish model going up. And in reality, we all seem to be evolved from sponges and uh, uh, mushrooms, but you know, you understand what I'm trying to get to with this story, of course. <laughs> but at the moment, when we then finally can stand up, then there still has to be this need to fine tune, you know, to make sure that we can make the best out of our body. And so when you have an exercise program like the Wudan Fitness and a diet program as uh, the help builder, the food medicine program, and you do indeed also the breath yoga and all the other things, in all these different kind of programs, what you learn every time is you try to, you come to understand that your fitness is not just because of one thing. It is because of many, many, many different kinds of things that are influencing, influencing this. And the whole day through, we're influenced by all kinds of things, by the things we eat, drink, uh, where we go, where we travel, how we travel, and so on and so forth. Right? So this, this uh, how do you say? This, this shaping of the trend of our health is actually the most important part, that we are generally going into the right direction, like what Anna said about the good habits, that the good habits actually, they change you. So this is basically what it is. And um, once you have a permanent trauma in your body, right? Uh, what's the word that I say, permanent? Something that is really damaged. It's very difficult to undo permanent damage because you have to grow your bones in a different direction. So it, it takes a long time. If there is a growth, which is... Uh, irreversible one way or the other because of a scar or whatever kind of things. Like I know for Marina, she has this place in her hand where the, the tissue is winding up because of uh, 
in Chinese medicine we call this uh, wood, wood shaping of your hand because of the liver pool. And then at that moment, uh, because of that, the hand gradually crawls in and it becomes harder and harder to stretch it because you know it is really very tight and it is tight, tightened up and stuff like this. And this is how the Chinese medicine sees it, of course. Um, so these kind of things are difficult to reverse. Not impossible, but difficult. If somebody has diabetes, uh, it seems uh, endless as a problem that is only going to get worse and worse and worse because it is gradually consuming your whole body and your whole health. But with the right approach and time, yeah, because that's the most important thing, you can gradually bend it into another direction. Not everything you can bend in other directions, but there's a lot of things that have a bit of flexibility and they need a disciplined and a broad spectrum approach to gradually bring them into change. And this, this health builder program, all the different kind of things, they, they, they allow the body to free itself a little bit so that corrections can be made by themselves. Like good diet makes, makes the corrections, good exercise makes corrections. But it, it, one way or the other, it can't be military, right? So for many people, it is very difficult to accept the fact that they can do something in a non-military way because we have never been raised like that. So that is one of the difficult things for most people when they start uh, to take the freedom to adapt it for their own needs. Yes, And that is why the Wood of Fitness is a great program because you as an instructor, every time when you give a class, you give another class, right? You never give two times the same class. So for students, they don't learn a form. Like when you do the Bumble Formula class, is every time it's the same. You can shift the attention a little bit, uh, but the the change that you get comes from that repetition. Well, the change that you get from the Wudang Fitness is from the change, right? So that changeability helps you to uh, emphasize a particular kind of discipline, uh, which is based also on something that you really have to work on while at the same time uh, take freedom. Yes? Another thing I wanted to also say through another conversation, and this will be part of my three minute uh, speech okay. as well, okay. uh, in addition to what I already said. Um, you know, I have been um, talking with some people in my uh, personal circle, uh, those that I thought that would be more open to a different practice from the Qigong, Jonah Qigong that I, I do. And one of the questions that came up from one of the, um, practitioners is that why why is there would be a need to do this if we already are doing a practice like qigong um that is holistic and it's going to take care of of everything right um and make us stay healthy and, and all of that that's been pretty much embedded in 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 the whole teaching and practice uh of the from my teachers and the practitioners Yep. So, so I, th I thought that um, was a good question because it is just, it's kind of breaking a barrier of what the thought of Qigong is and, and uh, as, as, as a lifestyle, uh, it's been defined as a lifestyle, but I do see that uh, some lifestyle incomplete in some ways because it's the way that I ex explain it is like if you're eating every day the same food, you know, even though it's healthy, um, it doesn't mean that that you're going to stay healthy because it's through variations and through different things. Our body, you know, we are human. We we don't relate to one thing only. It, our our body and mind needs different things, and we try to adapt to different things that can suit us. Um, so we we need to find that sweet spot and and relate to what's happening. Uh, you know, and it, so I, I try to explain that it was difficult sometimes to explain this, um, but it's basically kind of going back to the point of what are you feeling and what, what what are you trying to make your body health you how, you know, there there's always something that it's not doing well and something that you can improve, you know it. And I know through my Qigong practice, that's not enough because through my, and these people have practice and she still has anxieties and she still has, you know, all these other things. So that's a proof that there's something that's still not complete. 
it's not wholesome in that aspect. So it's it's a way to also complement the practice of Bhutan fitness to complement as another way of integrating that holistic health with this different as a tool. And it's a much freer tool than the practice itself, because as you mentioned earlier, it's more militaristic. So I practice as a habit every day, the same posture, but my muscles are not going to move more than what I do every day with one posture, you know? So uh, yeah. that was my point. That is also exactly what uh, I had as a observation before I started this whole download program. Is that people usually get stuck in a limited routine. And that routine is promising because of the marketing of the routine that is going to solve everything. And nice example is the Paduan Jing, the eight brocade uh, practice, which is basically for lazy Confucians to at least do something. Right? I make jokes about it many times. And it's not very deep practice. It's just a little bit of stretching. So at least you know, there's some movement of your internal body, but it's never going to be enough to make you healthy. But maybe it stimulates to actually go do more. That's true. Yeah. It's the same, I get people, of course, in my clinic many times, they go with uh, damage on their body because they only play football or they only play tennis or they only play uh, running or something like that, right? So as a result of that specialization, they actually cause problems for themselves. And that's with Qigong the same. In Qigong, you create also, when you stay limited to one particular form, you stay, you gradually create a particular kind of issues that can relate to that, to that particular form. Like for instance, when you meditate, you sit in your meditation, your dantian, uh, because of the way how you uh, fold your legs, very likely you're going to have eventually a lot of diarrhea coming. Also when you're vegetarian, you're only vegetarian, right? Then at a certain point, your defecation becomes uh, less uh, solid. Uh, and so on and so forth. So all these kind of things, they also create their own problems, right? So this, this variation is a sort of a requirement to get somewhere. And then you see that people who gradually become like masters in their field, they never did only one thing. They try to summarize it as one thing for you to make it easy to you. So what I what I did when I built up the Dowland program is uh, basically emphasizing the idea that all these masters who try to simplify things so that it becomes easily accessible for you do not do that, right? I learned it from a lot of different kind of things um, within the same school or the same thought or within different thoughts and stuff like this. And all these kind of things together, they help me. So if I would put them all together in one program and allow people access to all these different kind of things, that would be much better. And there's still a lot of things that are not in the program, right? Now, because uh, I've done so many things that it is impossible to all get them into the program. But with the program that we now have standing, like when we are ready with, uh, when I'm going to be ready a little bit more with uh, the, uh, the, the, the the exercise, the movement exercise things. For the bachelor program, I'm going to start with the organ massages and stuff like this. And then the communication with the spirits of the body and so on and so forth. So there's all kinds of levels of practices that have never really been addressed in, in the regular program. Uh, Marina has done that in the past with me. So she knows a little bit about it. Yes, uh, but you you, you see that there's a lot of things that still also can add one way or the other. And they're not going to be all, none of them is going to be like the final solution. And you have to find your way through all these programs eventually to figure out what works best for you. So the combination that Martina finds for herself, that is her main, going to be her main routine, or Anna or Marina or anybody else is going to be very different from anybody else. Yes? And nobody can do everything all the time. And unless when you indeed practice every day, 10, 12 hours, uh, which is probably unlikely. That's for most people. Yes? Okay, anybody else wants to say something? There are three minutes. Yeah. I've been, um, yeah. Who's uh, going to talk? Yeah, you, you I guess it's good. Uh, Martina says like, no, no, no. <laughs> I've been teaching now four lessons, and um, um, the first lesson we were only uh, four per persons, and um, one person didn't come uh, very often. Uh, she came twice at my house because she couldn't come. 
And now uh, there's a new person uh, coming. So I had to explain again what I explained to the others, that when you do this program, uh, the purpose is to have a better health and, and feel more agile, more uh, balanced. So um, we start easily and uh, the purpose is to be able to do 40 minutes in, in a row. But in the beginning, it's not possible because all my uh, people are, have, have something, uh, Parkinson's, MS or rheum rheumatics. So it, it's not possible for her, them to do the program for 40 minutes in a row. So everybody has a chair beside. So when it's not possible to, to go along, they can sit and do the, the, the exercise with the, the arms sitting, and then they can uh, get up when they ca can uh, do it again. So it's, it's uh, at their own uh, pace. And um, the breath uh, changing, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not so very strict. So it's, it's their own uh, body. They have to listen to their own body if they can do it quicker and have the same uh, breath uh, rhythm. So it's, uh, I let a little bit, a little bit uh, of their own initiative to, uh, to do the practice uh, this I show them. And I think it's, it's uh, rather good, I understand. <clears throat> the, the slow breathing is of course, one of the essential parts of the practice. Uh, so to allow people too much freedom in it um, is maybe not the best of ideas uh, in the sense that uh, when they at least try, they mm -hmm. gradually dis disengage their breathing and their movements. Because yeah. what you see with people normally is that they start synchronizing their breath with their movements. Mm -hmm. And that is actually causing the stress in their body. Right. Yeah. So but I, I breathe in and breathe out, but that they can hear it. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. And yeah. I, I do the pace quicker so yeah. that they can compare that I am breathing in and out slowly oh, and yeah. that uh, do the exercises quickly. Yeah, okay, very good. Because it is important for people to at least try, right? And for most people in the beginning, uh, to slow down the breathing is going to be really very hard. And so that this is for, that is for everybody is going to be the same. I mean, when I first learned that concept, I was like, what? What are you talking about? Moving slowly because you know because of the militarization of our thoughts and our feelings and stuff like this, we automatically associate movements with uh, with with breathing. And you see this in all the chikungs, and you see it in the kung fu, you see it in the in the boxing, you see it in the bodybuilding and stuff like this, and the aerobics. Everybody is co combining these kind of things, and then you see that because of this combination, a lot of problems come about. Every time again, the combination brings the problem come about. But at the moment when you separate them. And you actually free up the movements to go as fast as they need. And you need to free up the, the breath also to go as fast as, as it needs, which hopefully is as slow as possible. Yes, Susanna, what do you want to say? Um, I wanted to also point out this, this issue that I had uh, with a demo uh, with this special young uh, adult, um, because focus and attention and awareness and all this that has to do with the mind, is it's 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 a it's a challenge already. Yep. Um, so I have to break up a little bit the expectations of the breath and where to take it. If they are able at a certain stage to make a difference between uh, fast and slow, uh, that would be an achievement from the very beginning to the end of the exercise uh, of the whole series. So I don't really tell give them too much instructions on the breath except, um, you know, just just notice when they're doing the, like why did the Uchi stands in the beginning, you know, my idea this week, if I'm invited again, is for them to observe the breath in the beginning and in the end um, of the practice. Um, you know, when they start and when they end, if they can make a difference between what's slow and what's fast, that is a good, goal already you know um try so. try to during the practice every now and then just remind them on the slow breathing uh, because yeah. otherwise people really stop doing it i see like i give example my wife uh she wanted to uh, learn yoga she said like oh maybe then i can also become instructor i said okay good and uh, you can do the yoga the breath yoga um and the yoga exercise she liked very much right what she didn't like was doing the breathing 
Well, the breathing is the essential part of the breath yoga. Otherwise, it's not called breath yoga, right? So she never got further than just doing some exercise every now and then because she didn't like the breathing. It made her feel uncomfortable because that's what it does. Actually, the whole breathing thing makes you uncomfortable. And crossing that line of this uncomfortableness makes that the practice works. So in the only hindrance in the Wudong fitness is your breathing. All the other things, they are just superficial, like the space of your arms or something like this when they are broken or when they're infected or whether they are limited in your rib cage or in your hips or something like this. All these kind of things are relatively easy to overcome as soon as you know how to relax and do it in your own speed. Now, because that's it. I, I have this one client. She, I, I tell her already a year ago, okay, you have to exercise and you have to rotate your arms and then you have to fully rotate. But she rotates until she feels uncomfortable. And the fully rotation that she has to do is way past where she feels uncomfortable. But the space is there because when I massage her, you know, she has all this rotation space and she doesn't hurt. But at the moment when she has to go around and at a certain point, she has to make an effort and she identifies effort with pain. Right. And that's what most people do. They identify effort with pain. And with breathing, that's a different kind of thing, because if they breathe more slowly, they feel like they're going to have not enough energy to do things because they think breath is energy, right? Because this is the military perspective. Okay, you, have, you are basically like a machine, and if you don't put the oxygen in it, your fuel will not burn, right? Because that's basically what they try to explain to you all the time. Everywhere where you go, you talk about this uh, energy burn that you have to have. And they have to, you have to have this burn because you have to burn fat and you have to have this burn because you have to be strong and you have to have that burn to be fast and all these kind of things. All, all the time you have to burn things. Basically, that's the Kristallnacht, right? From uh, Germany. You have to burn because then you can change things. Uh, the Cultural Revolution in China, same. You have to burn everything down. Uh, the, 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 the Stalinist Revolution, burn everything down. Um, just recently with Donald Trump, we have to just burn everything down and then everything will change, right? And this is our mentality. This is, this is our continuous mentality about our body and about our biology and stuff like this. Uh, <clears throat> and and this, this, this breathing really is the, is the crux from which people can break through this thing. So the slow breathing is an essential part. They don't have to breathe very slow, but just slower than their movement so that they dis, disengage their movement from their breathing. As, as long as they keep mixing them together or getting them together, they will not notice the difference. They will notice some difference, but, but they will get more easily out of breath also because of the fast movement that they move faster. But if they breathe slowly, they will notice they will eventually, slowly, they will get less out of breath. So try to try to hold on to that part because it's an essential part of the, of the practice. Make sure that you always pay attention to the slow breathing. If they do it or not do it, that's not your responsibility, right? But you have to make sure one way or the other to mention it a few times during the lesson because it is it is basically what it is all about. And then, then if they follow over time, because not everybody notices it in the beginning that you're really serious about it, then they don't they don't believe it or they don't trust it. They have uh, anxieties or fears or whatever kind of things about what's going to happen to them if they breathe more slowly. And they gradually, eventually will become curious enough to try it. And that is also why you have to just keep on mentioning it try to induce people to do it. And if they do it or not, that's up to them. Yes? So you don't have to worry about that part because you're only there as an instructor. You're not trying to teach them that this is working like that. You just have to try to show them that if they breathe slowly, it will work like that. And you try to make them hold on to the slow breathing over time. I mean, for myself, sometimes I forget to breathe slowly with some exercises because I'm getting so excited by these exercises. I'm like, <laughs> almost like this, same. Yeah. <clears throat> but if I run, for instance, uh, like I run to the school with my kids sometimes, I try to breathe as slowly as possible because then at that moment, I can run the whole piece in, in one time. If I re breathe because of the pressure I feel from the running and I follow my, my running uh, instead of my breathing, I, get, I have to stop like 10 times. Um, well, I live just a kilometer, two kilometers away from the school. Yes. So that's just automatic, it's just part of the, part of the thing. And this is, this is how you gradually also overcome your weakness. That's like building the good habits that, uh, that Anna mentioned. And that also is, of course, on one day is it better and the other day is worse. Like that Susanna also explained the same. Yes? 
Mm, but there are good points in itself. It is really like a you have to every time in the beginning for sure you have to figure out how to get people on that part because the the reading is such an essential part of it, right? And it is funny because I always say chi is not breathing exercises, right? I always say that chi is not breathing exercises because everybody says like chi is just like breath, but in fact, yes, this is a breathing exercise, yes, or it's actually a no breathing exercise. Yeah, that's basically it. But chi is a no breathing exercise in general. But well, it's the difficult part. And there's another funny thing with it, because when you do the bamboo formula Qigong, it is bamboo formula because it's a formula. All Qigongs are formula exercises. And the Wudang Fitness is a formula exercise, but it doesn't have a clear form. While the bamboo formula Qigong is really very clearly formed, right? So these are, these are different things. Great, I guess, and uh, great to sign up, both of you, all uh, good, uh, good remarks. And anybody else want to say something, Marina or Martina? You already get up with the story in the meantime? No? Maybe next time. It's okay, no problem. <clears throat> well, there's one thing, or well, one subject that is maybe uh, not covered already by the others. Um, Somewhere in the beginning, you also said it's also important to try to figure out how you can use the things that you learn in Wudang Fitness outside in daily life, so outside of the exercise time. And I think that is one of the most valuable things for me in this course, that uh, however difficult it is to slow down breathing and not uh, do it in coordination with your movements, it does help a lot if you can transfer it to your daily life, which makes it almost in a different way, but almost if you have to do physical work, physical labor, which is not stopping, so you work for longer times. It does really help to uh, watch your breathing and try to do it in the Wudang fitness way. And therefore, and that helps also in daily life even if it's if the direct effect of the exercise you do in the Wudong fitness are maybe not beneficial for what you do in your work, that part can be very beneficial. That's right. Very good. Uh, <clears throat> it is indeed uh, like that with all the different kind of programs, the whole Dowland program, is when you can transfer it to your daily life. Uh, that's the most important part. And I remember uh, one, uh, one participant in my regular Zomuchiko classes a long time ago, and uh, he stayed in the class for about a year, and then he got too busy with his work and he couldn't come anymore. And then I see him like uh, 10 years later or so. And he says like, I have one thing I never forgot uh, from all your practices is make sure that the three gates are open. So whatever, whatever I do, and I open up my joints, I stretch out my arms sometimes, I'm typing a long time, I'm sitting like that for, for a while. And if necessary, I go stand in the wide stance and I do like that for like five minutes because look where I can't do it. But then I can immediately work two hours again. So this is something that stayed in the body and uh, I could every time do that again, sort of help me always. Um, but the fact that he works behind the computer, he does a lot of editing work. He's a, he's a video maker, a movie maker, actually. And uh, that was actually like a, the biggest help that he ever had in his whole life uh, as, a, as a contribution. So he doesn't do the practice anymore, but he transferred it accurately into his daily life. And as a result of that, he was able to do all kinds of things that he wouldn't be able to do before. And I very often, since the time, I, I point out very often, like everything you do in your life is exercise. Now, the Dowland program is based on everyday life activities, right? It is not based on trying to make your life fit with your exercise. It is trying to fit your exercise with your activities. So the intensity of the exercise and the intensity of your life should be more or less on a par, right? Not too much different. And then at the moment, when you, when you are able to do that, you see that both of them, they gradually increase. So your daily life gradually increase and your exercise level gradually increase. And then the principles of the exercise can be applied in anything, whether it's from Bamboo Fuma Chumuna Wudang Fitness or the breath yoga, or uh, whether it is uh, from um, meditation or something else. It doesn't really matter. All these things, they apply to your daily life. You do them all day through, basically, and all day through. And then you make everything into exercise.
And that's good because every day is a preparation for the next. Yes, there's no, there's no final day, you know, hopefully. <laughs> yes? Yeah, Anna, what do you want to say? Absolutely, Cockwell, every day. Good. Anna, what do you want to say? Um, I just want to go back. Um, what was it? Two questions before that you were speaking about a variation of, you know, of doing the breath yoga, of doing, of having a variety of things, um, of how important it is even in our profession. Uh, I've seen so many people maybe doing let's just take massage, which is very the same thing for the, for, for two years or three years and how they actually end up uh, doing harm to their body. Mm. The whole repetition of, of just not, um, um, not I don't know, of not changing and not um, because I see that every day, especially the one with the youngsters, the, yep. the ones that are still in their twenties, that uh, they could be working for maybe a year, two years, and they're completely damaged. The lower back, the upper back, everything is, um, and I see that no one really has the need to, to learn new things, to make a combination, because um, I've been doing this for 20 years, and, and everyone will say even once a week, the treatment will always be different, because you adapt, so you don't live in that routine, which yeah. it comes with the same comparison as even exercising, because we are working with our bodies, and if you do that, I know people were counting treat, uh, movements, I had a, a, someone that would count 100 movements and then go into the next movement, I'm like, that sounds like more like torture to me for an hour and a half okay. to count how many times you're doing a movement so you can keep. <laughs> I must admit, when you do Dao Yin, you actually do every movement like 81 times and stuff like this. Uh, you have to count them. <laughs> you have to count them, yeah. You have to make sure because you have to go through a particular kind of change for which you first have to get exhausted. <laughs> okay. The thing is, most people that do exercises mindlessly. Exactly. Yeah, and then you do harm to yourself. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a different thing. Uh, like, for instance, when we do the Tumuchiku, every movement has to be done eventually 81 times. And so when you do them like that, gradually your muscles and your bones change faster so that you get the, into the ideal body shape for your exercises more quickly, which is very hard, especially in the beginning. So you can't do that from the beginning. You have to gradually grow to that part. Once you have achieved it, you just have to maintain it, right? So you don't have to do it your whole life. Yeah, no, exactly. So I just want to say how important variation is yeah. in every day, in yeah. your everyday routine. It's the same like with eating. I mean, you don't eat every day only fries. You eat the next day. You eat uh, pasta. So, <laughs> right? You have to create variation. Oh, great, great. You have all said really very wonderful things. Yes. Um, anybody wants to add something to it? So I have a question. Yeah. Um. It, uh, in, in one of the things that we always uh, insist with the um, Qigong that I practiced in Bichanan is that if somebody cannot do a movement or it's difficult, they can just simply uh, use their mind and imagine that they are doing that movement. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Can we use that kind of uh, idea also with the Udan fitness? To encourage people to say, okay, I can't move my shoulders, but you can imagine that you are moving your shoulders like this, like that. It's a little bit of a difficult issue to say that because yes, uh, use your mind for something helps. Uh, if you can do the exercise and then you cannot do it anymore. But if you cannot do it yet, it doesn't work. Because then you make a mental projection, you make yourself very satisfied, but you don't add anything to your body because your body cannot recognize the move. On the other hand, if you are like lying flat in your bed, yes, you can imagine that you make muscle contractions because you have to, for instance, you have to gradually relearn how to use your muscles, right? So then you're imagining that you're making muscle contractions um, in a similar kind of way. If you can't lift your arms anymore, you can, uh, imagine yourself to make this movement again to try to get your body to activate like that. So on that level in Qigong, using your imagination to do something or your intent, actually not so much your imagination, but your intent, you try to do the movement. But maybe your intent has to swing it up a little bit more. So it's not like instead of, 
but as a starting point. And, and, and then at the moment when you have done it and you can't do it anymore, then just uh, imagining it can already help you go through the routine of your exercise. Like one thing that we do in Tai Chi Chuan, once you get past a certain kind of level, you start sitting and meditate, you go through your Tai Chi Chuan routine only in your mind. Now you have already worked with imaginary boyfriends and stuff like this. And at a certain point, uh, <clears throat> you can do it inside your mind. And then at that moment, you can feel all the change that your body goes through. You can feel inside your body because of what you have learned before, right? And then, then it actually works. But if you have never done the exercise before, it actually doesn't add anything to you. And it's just a mental projection. It makes you feel satisfied. And that is what most people seek for in, in, when they do Qigong. They, have, they try to feel satisfied about things. Um, you have not, you have to, I think we have to remind ourselves when we are giving classes, and a lot of people, they are in the class because they are unsatisfied about their life and about their feelings and about their success and so on and so on. So they look for means to be successful in, in, in what they look for, if it is in being a good husband or wife, or if it is in a good, being a good child to their parents, or if it is in uh, being a good worker or being more successful in whatever kind of work they do, or sports or something like this. So they have all kinds of reasons for which they try to look for an enhancement. And Qigong has this image as if it makes you happy and successful and stuff like this. Like yoga also has this kind of image. They try to build on that image. And the thing is that if your body functions better, yes, you will be successful in all kinds of things if you need to be, right? But then you have to put the work and the discipline still in it. It's going to be the same. And it's with exercise the same. Actually, Qigong is a means to learn the kind of discipline, the kind of attention and trying to get past your fear for doing a particular kind of movement. Uh, so in that sense, uh, from traditional perspective um, about movement, mm -hmm. just working from your mind is not going to be enough in most cases. I cannot say 100%, but in most cases it will not be enough to actually get people to actually do the movements or to get that kind of improvement. But some people are very able to give themselves this physical experience when they move through the body. But because people focus on energy, it's mostly just mental projection. Yes, because Qigong is about moving your body primarily. And if you, like what we saw with Agnes also, if you can't move your arm up or you can't stretch it out, by every time trying to do it, gradually you get more space. And sometimes you have a bad moment. It feels like, oh, no, not now. Yeah, but most of the time, eventually you get it better. And gradually over time, maybe after years, you know, you think back and think, hey, I didn't have the problem really for This is how it works. Yes. So the intent is always in the actual movement. But, but for instance, if somebody does do Tai Chi Chuan, I listen always to my own attention, how it reflects on my body. If my body doesn't react on somebody else's body, that means there's nothing there. Right? Then somebody doesn't do anything. So I, if I look at my students and I, uh, whether I see it on, uh, on screen or whether I uh, see them in uh, life, I always pay attention to my Dantian and uh, see if they reflect. And if I can feel the reflection, I know like, okay, they're really practicing. If they're not really practicing, then there's nothing building up on the inside. And so that is very visible from the top, looking from the top down, so to say, that is very visible. And with most people that I know that are practicing Qigong, I see them practice and I see them show demonstrations and stuff like this, and nothing very much happened. Uh, so then you can say like, okay, so they have been exercising, but they haven't done chico. But that's a difficult thing. And if you don't see somebody practice, you can't know that. Really. Yeah, because things don't resonate. And it's just about resonation. It's just a natural thing. Yes. It's not that somebody radiates energy or something like this. It's just that uh, like when you have two guitars next to each other, you pluck one snare on the one and the other one is tuned in the same way, it will also vibrate. This is what it is. Yes? Okay. Very good. Well, I think this was a very interesting conversation. I'm definitely going to use some of the pieces from the conversation of today as part of the promotion from the app also, because you have said some really very wise uh, things and uh, uh, they're really, I think a lot of people should know about them. I should also write it out probably and uh, try to see 
how uh, the how how that would work out as a textual thing. So uh, I'm going to think about how to use that properly. But anyway, it will be somewhere visible in the app. This video where people who are not part of this program and uh, they also can uh, see it when they just enter the app. And I don't know exactly how to do that, but I will figure it out. Yes. All right. Very much thanks for today. It was a very nice conversation. I hope uh, everybody will be up to speed next week. And uh, I hope to have uh, the other chapters uh, ready. I, was, uh, I had chapter three and four from the food uh, app ready, but I can't find them anywhere anymore. So I don't know what I did with them. I must have by accident deleted them or something. I have no idea. Can't find them. Yeah, so I have to do them again. I've been looking at it the whole weekend to install them before the the, the day today started. That is also why we got a little bit different program today than originally planned. So great. Are you going to oh, oh. I'm first going to stop the recording? I have to get my mouse ready. Yeah.